Well, good morning and welcome. Please do be seated. My name is Sarah Archer and it's my pleasure and privilege to welcome you here to St. Albans Church um, for this service of Holy Communion. And a particular welcome if you're here for the first time or back for the first time after a long time. And also if you're watching for the first time online. We're not having a children's talk today because we're not having an adult talk either. And so I'd like to invite the choir because there's going to be a little bit of chat to come forward and sit in these pews just at the start of the service. And I'll send you back in a little while. That's everybody. That would be lovely. Um, at our last ministry team, it was strongly agreed that we should have what is known in Roman Catholic circles as a teaching mass. So basically a service where we explain why we do what we do. Um, you may have some questions, but I'm afraid um, they'll have to wait till the end. I'm hoping that I may answer all the questions in the course of this service, but if not, please do come to me afterwards and I will put them in an article in Monthly Matters. Um, before we begin our worship proper, I'd just like to mention that we've just sung a hymn together, which is a reminder, really, that we're all entering worship together as one family. The word hymn comes from the Greek word hymnos, which means a song of praise. And we paused, as you might have noticed, to bow to the altar, the place where we celebrate Holy Communion, because that's the place that most represents Christ in this place. Now there are different names for the roles of the people in the team and so they're the altar party we call them and they make up the procession. I wonder if you could stand up Adrian. Adrian, oh you weren't, no you were the gospel, that's right sorry. Lisa you are the crucifer. She was carrying the cross, basically crucifer means the person who carries the cross. The acolytes, thank you very much. Uh, the people who carry the candles and serve at the altar. And the term acolyte comes from a Greek word, akolutheo, which means to follow or accompany. Um, we have someone who carries the gospel book sometimes, and the person who reads it, called the deacon. Um, I am the president. <laughs> you could call me Mr. President. Um, no, I'm the person who leads the service and presides at the Eucharist. I don't really like the term celebrant, although it's sometimes used, because I figure that we're all here to celebrate the Eucharist, but I'm just the one presiding over it. This, our service of worship is also known as the liturgy, a word which can also mean the work of the people, as well as the words that are spoken in worship. And I just want to, first of all, make, uh, let you know about the colours of um, we use in church but I might not need some children to help me with this one. So um, we change colors according to the season. Does anybody know what this one is, what season we celebrate with this one? Does anybody know? Well, you can say it's Trinity. We just wear green in what they call it ordinary time. So anyway, that's green for ordinary time. So I'll be putting this on later. Um, do you know what white is? Anybody? Yeah? Um, that's a good, a good idea, that, for winter. But no, it it's means it's for special big celebrations. So for Easter and Christmas. And also for other things that you might call sacraments. So sometimes people wear them for marriage, but they, the, the common bap things are baptism. Um, people have it for confirmations, ordinations, and you might have noticed at my licensing. Adrian will never forget. <laughs> um, Red. Do you know what that's for? Yes, Leo? That's good. He's, got, he's into colours of roses, aren't you? That's what you're thinking of. No, this is some... Um, red is worn for martyrs and for the Holy Spirit because red is the colour of... Yeah? Did you say blood? Yeah, it's blood. And the Holy Spirit is represented by what that's red? Yeah, Leo? Fire, that's right, so you've got fire. Now, purple, I looked that up because I have to say, I do like purple. It's definitely my color. 
And I just thought, why is such a glorious color? Because you know when Jesus was crucified, they put a purple robe on him, which is the color of a king. But actually, um, it's the color for which seasons? Does anybody know? Did you say? Advent, yes. We wear it for Advent and Lent. And these are the seasons which are seasons of penitence when we say sorry to God. Now, I read an explanation on the internet which made actual sense to me. In the past, people used to wear black for the penitential seasons. And as anybody who's got a black clergy, black clergy shirt, they'll know that the color fades. And I think that it ended up that people had things that were black and then over the years, the centuries, they faded to purple. So that might be why we end up wearing purple because they went, oh, well, what color is it? Oh, well, it's this color, purple. So there you go. I didn't know that, but um, so that's the colors. Um, this is the book of the gospel, which is brought, carried in. So I can go up to the altar, thank you. Um, and this is the lectionary. This holds all the readings that we have on a Sunday, including the gospel reading. So that's the lectionary. Um, now, then we move to the linens. Now, before I take the bread and wine, at the moment I'm using holy hand sanitizer. Um, but before, you might have seen that somebody would come up and they'd wash, uh, they'd pour water over my hands and the water would go into a bowl and there'd be a towel that I'd wipe my hands on. And both the bowl and the towel are called the lavabo, which is a simple word which means to wash. So uh, if anyone knows a bit of French, you know, oh look, there we go. He's demonstrating it beautifully for us, the hand washing, so there we go. Um, the corporal, this is the corporal, which is not corporal, um, but it's, it's a square thing, often has a cross at one end, and it goes on the altar. And it's called corporal because it has the body of Christ on it, and the, the Latin for body is corpus, where we get corpse, so corporal. And if you like, it's like our placemat on the table. Um, it means, actually, if there's a spill, because you've got these massive white linens, it's very practical, because if you get wine on one of those, they're quite a job to wash and iron, as those who look after the linen will attest. So if, most of the time, any little spills go onto that, and that's very easy to launder. Um, the pure, this is what they call a purificator. It's used to wipe the cup um, and it's I guess if you like purificator something that makes clean um, this is known does anybody know what this is called yeah a chalice yes and chalice is just uh, a Latin term for cup so it's a cup um, this does anybody know what this is called? No? It's called a pattern. Um, P-A-T-E-N. And um, sometimes it can be more of a bowl, but it's because the word pattern actually means a shallow dish rather than a plate. I thought it meant plate, but it doesn't. It means a shallow dish. Um, and that's what we place the elements to be consecrated on. And this is similar in shape to the chalice. Do you know what this is called? No? It's called a cyborium. Um, and it usually has a lid on it. So actually cyborium in Latin just means a drinking cup. So obviously they just used to use it to hold the bread. Um, Anglicans believe different things about what happens in Holy Communion. Some believe that this service that we're about to celebrate is simply a memorial, so just a remembrance of what Jesus did. But the other end, there's a, there are those who believe that the bread and wine becomes the actual body and blood of Jesus. That's the Roman Catholic doctrine, but it's also some very high church Anglicans believe that too. 
And that process by which the body and blood, the bread and wine becomes the body and blood, is called transubstantiation. So I'll be testing you all on that next week, children, all right? Um, it, it's, it doesn't mean, you know, you look at it, it looks like bread and wine, but it's actually, it has become that, even though the elements look the same. Others, like me, are sort of a little bit towards the transubstantiation end, uh, but definitely not at the memorial end, which is that you believe, and I believe, that something happens to the bread and wine, that it becomes, Christ becomes specially present in it. And that's a process that is called transignification. Um, and that's why we're so careful about cleaning up afterwards and consuming all the elements. You don't just sort of throw them down the drain. Um, so, and that's why we genuflect, which is the kneel, kneeling. Oh, dearie me. Um, so genuflection, sometimes people bow. That's why we ring the bell during communion to indicate that something has happened to the bread and the wine. So um, I'd just like to ask the altar party if you could take all these things back and pop the stoles back into the um, thing. I'll, the lectionary, yes, yeah, so the lectionary, I'll take this. This goes to a particular part of this church and you may know it's called the Ambo. Now, I didn't know what an ambo was. It sounded like a kind of small furry animal, um, but it's, it's not. Um, it just means an elevated place or a mountain, which makes sense because you need to be able to be seen. So ambo just means a raised place. Uh, the other thing people have is a lectern, which we've now got at the back of church. So, you know, that's another term for the same thing. Um, as you can see, I already have my alb on. Oh, I've just lost. Would you mind bringing me my green stole? Sorry. Um, this alb is a reminder of my baptism. As you know, when adults and babies are baptized, they often have a white garment on. And the name alb probably came from a thing called the tunica alba, the white undergarment worn by Romans. Thank you. Um, you, it might help you to remember the word alb because albumin is the protein found in egg and that's white, egg white, so there we go. Um, now I'm going to put on a thing called a stole. It, this is symbolic too. Um, some people kiss the cross that's on the back before putting it on and it's I had this wonderful image that somebody said it's like you've seen pictures of Jesus with a lamb on his shoulders as the good shepherd and the stole if you like is a reminder to me of my pastoral responsibilities um, it's not well, you know his yoke is easy and his burden is light uh, because it's not that kind of a yoke the other thing is somebody said I don't know whether I believe this that it's a sign of service because it's like a pair of oven gloves bringing food to the table. So that's, that's one thing. Um, oh, okay, you can take the table. Yes, so I'll take that out of the way. Um, in our church, we call the person who reads the gospel the deacon. Um, now, the proper term really would be liturgical deacon because Adrian and all the people who read the gospel in this place are not ordained as deacons. In the Anglican Church, um, people like me and David were all ordained as deacons and then for the first year of being a curate and then after that they're ordained priest. And we remain as deacons, so it's not like we become something else. We, we have remained deacons and priests and bishops remain deacons and priests as well. So all those orders are still there. Um, ordained deacons wear their stole over their left shoulder and tied on the right like that and it's um, you'll see that sometimes even liturgical deacons sometimes do that and it's a sign of service you know if you remember at the last supper Jesus 
wore a towel. He tied a towel around him to wash the, the disciples' feet. And deacons also were originally serving at table, so that's where it comes from. So all priests and deacons are called to service. Now the next garment, do you know what the name of this thing is? Anybody? Yeah? Okay. It's called a chasuble. Um, somebody may remember in The Importance of Being Earnest, there was a, a, a priest called Reverend Chasuble. Um, and chasuble, let's make sure I've got my mic on the right place, um, actually means little house, which is quite nice, isn't it? It's like a tent, very appropriate. So the, this is, well, it's quite big, um, and it's basically the outer garment that would have been worn in Roman times. And I love the idea that if a Roman was put in a time machine, Roman Christian came here, they'd go, oh, that's a bit like the one I've got in my cupboard, because they'd be wearing the same sort of clothes. And so um, it connects us, I think. These robes connect us with the very beginning of the church, so it's like an unbroken line of continuity so that we can be part of that. In fact, a lot of the words that we use in our worship are exactly the same as were used in the early church. So thank you all for sitting, all the choir. If you'd like to come back to your places and then we can, now I'm properly dressed, we can now begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now some people make that outward sign of a cross at this point. It's a sign that through our baptism we have been marked with the name of God, if you like. We've been clothed with the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The words, the Lord be with you. Um, are words that St. Paul uses, similar ones, at the start of all his letters to the churches. Things like grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. As part of this introductory rite, we go into what's known as the penitential rite. The purpose is to say to God, look, I'm here now. I may not have had the best week. I know I haven't behaved this week the way I should have done. And I've thought and I've said things that I shouldn't have done. But here I am. And through this right, God is able to say to us, no matter what's gone on, I want you here. Later on in the service, we'll be remembering the sacrifice of Jesus. But we can reap the benefits at any time, and especially right now. We asked for God to forgive us. And in that, he makes us worthy to come into his presence to worship. Not just now, but always. We begin with this prayer to remind us that God knows us and sees us and to ask for his cleansing. Now, during worship, we adopt different positions to signify different things. For example, in some churches, um, unlike us, people stand for the intercessions as a sign that they're standing before God as his child. For prayers of penitence, if we're able, we kneel. Now, men kneel to ask a woman to marry them. It's a physical sign that it's something we really want. And if you do a Bible search on the word, on the internet, you can do that, um, biblegateway.com, you just put the word knee in the search box and it will show you all the different references to kneeling and knees and going down on one knee and quite often it's about that is the posture that people adopt in prayer when they're asking God and beseeching him for things so that's a normal posture to approach God and so there's another aspect to kneeling we're not bodies who cart around a spirit like a rucksack. 
We are embodied spirits. What we do with our bodies affects our souls and our spirits. So when we stand and sing and look up, we will feel more joyful. And when we physically kneel, even if we don't feel particularly penitent or like we want to come to God, our bodies can help our minds get into the right frame of mind to really say sorry to God. So only if you're able, please kneel now to pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolve to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us to amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're now going to stand to sing the Gloria. The full name is the Gloria in excelsis, which just means glory to God in the highest in Latin. We don't sing it in Advent and Lent, and although it's been our practice to use it at midweek services, it's not usually used in most churches except on Sundays and major festivals. Let's stand. Pray the collect, so called because it collects up 
the themes in the service. Almighty and everlasting God, increase in us your gift of faith, that forsaking what lies behind and reaching out to that which is before, we may run the way of your commandments and win the crown of everlasting joy through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We now move to the second part of the liturgy, which is when we prepare our hearts to hear the word of God. The first reading on Sunday is usually from one of the letters in the New Testament or the Acts of the Apostles. Occasionally, it will be from the Old Testament. This is God's word to us. A reading from the book of Hebrews. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. And he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Now God did not subject the coming world about which we are speaking to angels, but someone has testified somewhere, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, or mortals that you care for them. You have made them for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned them with glory and honour, subjecting all things under their feet. Now in subjecting all things to them, God left nothing outside their control. As it is, we do not yet see everything in subjection to them but we do see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honour because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Now at this point in many services of worship in churches, some people will sing or say something from the Psalms, which is our word to God. It reminds us that we're, not, we're called not just to listen to God, but to tell him what's really on our hearts. In this church, we sing the so-called gradual hymn. The hymn gets its name from the Latin gradus, meaning step, because it referred to the hymn chanted on the step of the ambo or, um, or altar before the gospel was said or sung. During this hymn, we have the procession of the gospel, which bears witness to the importance that we're placing on the words of Jesus. It's why we also stand or remain standing to hear it. When the gospel's announced, the reader may make the sign of the cross on the page. Some also may sign themselves on the forehead, lips, and breast, signifying that their prayer, that the gospel may be in their minds 
on their lips and in their hearts. So we now stand to sing our gradual hymn, number 602. He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. Jesus said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them, and the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Now the sermon has been a feature of Holy Communion since the very earliest days of the church. It's not supposed to be just an explanation of what Jesus' words meant then, but also what they might mean to us now and how we can apply them to our lives. One theologian said that the word of God 
is there to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. And so please pray for all of us who preach here that we will not water down God's word or misrepresent the good news. After the sermon, we usually stand for the recitation of the creed. And although it has been our practice to use it at midweek services, it's not usually used in most churches except on Sundays and major festivals. The Nicene Creed, properly so-called, was issued in 325 at the Council of Nicaea to defend the faith against a heresy called Arianism. It was because of a man called Arius and he had followers called Arians. And um, Arius had taught that the Son of God was not eternal, but was a created being. Created before the ages, but created by the Father from nothing as an instrument for the creation of the world. That's why in the Nicene Creed, which seeks to destroy this heresy, there's this stress on the begotten, not made. So you can hear them going, no! Apparently there was quite a fist fight at the Council of Nicaea. So this is really important. So begotten, not made. And it includes in the Greek, in the original Greek, a vital word which you will never ever use in normal speech, okay? And I won't be testing you on this one. It's homoousios. Um, it means of one substance. And that, was, that word was sort of specifically created really to refute that heresy that Jesus was a created being and he wasn't just part of the Godhead. Now the creed we say contains much of the original Nicene Creed, but actually the earliest authorities connect it with a council in Constantinople in 381. So that's still pretty old. Now during the words, and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, you may notice when you go to other churches, and sometimes if you watch people, they may bow at this point. And that's a sign of honor for the incarnation. Does anybody know what the incarnation means? No? Ever been to an Italian restaurant? Yeah? Do you know what the meat bit, when they say there's a bit about meat, what that course is called? They have pesche for fish? Carne. Or pesche, is it? Carne. Carne. So, incarnation means the enfleshment of God. And that's what, that's what Christmas is all about. We're celebrating the incarnation. So, there we go. Watch out for carne at the next Italian restaurant you get to. So, we bow as a sign of honour of the incarnation, the mystery of God becoming human flesh and blood. Making the sign of the cross at the end of the creed is an ancient custom used by early Christians to proclaim their faith. So now, let us stand to affirm our faith in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen, we believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit, and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Now the leader of our prayers of intercessions is praying on behalf of all the people and so they're usually led by a lay person to represent that. We're moving now to have prayers led from the back of church as this helps to remind us that these are the prayers of the people. They're not to be sat back and listened to but joined in with and prayed. Once again, if we're able, it helps our bodies to remember we're making requests of God by kneeling. So let us kneel if we're able to pray for the church and the world and thank God for his goodness. Heavenly Father, we pray for peace in the church and peace among all people. Take away the hardness of heart which divides families, breeds strife between people, and sets nation against nation. Let the simple trust of a child draw the peoples of the world together in peace. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for parents and children at this time of anxiety with so many fears for the future well-being of our nation. Bless the homes of those within our church and community. Guide the teachers and all who work with children, especially our youth and families leader, Chris Nolder, that he may be given wisdom to share the love of Jesus with sensitivity and grace. Lord, in your mercy, We pray for those whose lives have been broken by divorce or separation. Heal the wounds they have suffered and grant them the spirit of reconciliation and hope for future happiness. And we pray for the parents and family of Sarah Everard and all young women brutally murdered. And for our police chiefs, that they will be given wisdom to find effective ways of delivering a service that is impartial, empathetic to all, and dedicated in seeking the truth. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for all refugees, especially those who have fled their homes from Afghanistan. We pray for the coordinating efforts of Harrow citizens to galvanize support in housing three families. We pray that our hearts may be moved to help provide financial support. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those who are sick at this time and those who care for them remembering especially those from our own community, Peter, Enid, Lorna, Dennis, Louise, Maureen, Kirsten, Arthur, Norman, and Fiona. And for those with long-term health needs, Leanne, Sybil, Cyril, Jean, and Jim. and we give thanks for the recovery of Anne and Julie. May all who suffer know your love as they receive the care of friends and family. Lord, in your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for the lives of those who have recently departed this life, including David Chester 
and Anne Pocock, and remembering the anniversaries of death of Albert Chesterton and Bat Betty Lamborn. Give comfort to those who mourn, and may those who have died rest in your eternal peace. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Do be seated. After our prayers of intercession, we move to the third part of the service, called the Liturgy of the Sacrament. It begins with sharing the peace. This is very important, and we'll continue at the moment to share the peace using sign language. The peace is not just the time to say, how do you do to your neighbor, um, but it's also an opportunity to bring to mind, who am I not at peace with? before coming to communion and to ask, Lord, please help me to be at peace with them. And is there anything I need to do? Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount tell us that if we bring our gift to the altar and we haven't made peace with our brother or sister, then we need to stop and go and do that before we do that. Now, it might not always be possible but it's a good reminder, the peace, that we should work towards that. Would you please stand? Christ is our peace. He has reconciled us to God in one body by the cross. We meet in his name and we share his peace. And the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also Peace be with you. We now have the offertory. The offertory is the part of the service when the bread and the wine for use in the service are ceremonially placed on the altar. Although an offering of money is usually also received then, that is not the offertory. But please don't underestimate the spiritual significance of your giving. Jesus said we can either serve God or mammon, and that doesn't mean that we either go to church or go shopping. While the offertory hymn happens, the servers prepare the table and gifts using the corporal, purificator, chalice, pattern and ciborium. Let's sing our offertory hymn number 586.
Now, just before the priest prays under normal circumstances, there's the washing of the hands. Now, this had a practical purpose in that in the past, people wouldn't just bring up money as Jerry has, um, but they would bring things like sheep and chickens and fish as their offerings to God. And the priest would receive these things. So they'd have to wash their hands before they started to pray the Eucharistic prayer. But then it brought on another significance. And the priest may pray under their breath, wash away my iniquities and cleanse me from my sin as they wash their hands. Priests remind themselves that they're unworthy to pray this most holy part of the service. And we can only do so thanks to the cleansing and forgiveness of God. The prayers that you're now just about to hear are rooted in Judaism, where they're known as Baraka prayers, an expression of praise or thanks given to God, recited at specific points in the liturgy or before meals at home. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has created the fruit of the vine. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to set before you, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. You may have noticed that the priest may add a small amount of water to the chalice, recalling the fact that when Jesus died on the cross, water and blood flowed from his side when it was pierced with a spear. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to set before you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become for us the cup of salvation. Blessed be God forever. We now move to the Eucharistic prayer. Eucharisto is Greek for thanks. So it's a prayer of thanksgiving. The priest prays to God on behalf of the people. And it begins with a dialogue which is sung. It's known as the Sursum Corda. Sursum Corda is simply Latin for lift up your hearts. And it's a feature of the very earliest Eucharistic prayers. The Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God. From sunrise to sunset, this day is holy For Christ has risen from the tomb and scattered the darkness of death with light that will not fade. This day the risen Lord walks with your gathered people, unfolds for us your word, and makes himself known in the breaking of bread. And though the night will overtake this day, you summon us to live in endless light, the never-ceasing Sabbath of the Lord. And so, with choirs of angels and with all the heavenly host, we proclaim your glory and join their unending song of praise, singing what is known as the Sanctus, and Sanctus is Latin for holy.
We're now moving to the part of the Eucharistic prayer, which contains the epiclesis, the calling down of the Holy Spirit on the gifts we've prepared, signified by the sign of the cross over the elements of bread and wine. We praise and bless you, loving Father, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And as we obey his command, send your Holy Spirit that broken bread and wine outpoured may be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. We now move on to what is known as the institution narrative recalling the words Jesus spoke when he was celebrating the Last Supper with his disciples. On the night before he died, he had supper with his friends, and taking bread, he praised you. He broke the bread, gave it to them, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he took a cup of wine. Again, he praised you, gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So, Father, as we remember all that Jesus did, we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross, bringing before you the bread of life and cup of salvation. We proclaim his death and resurrection until he comes in glory. What we all say next is known as the memorial acclamation or anamnesis. Anamnesis is a Greek word meaning memorial. It's something that the president and the people pray together and it's really important because the people together acclaim what the president has just prayed in the Eucharistic prayer. Great is the mystery of faith. And justice and mercy will be seen in all the earth. Look with favor on your people, gather us in your loving arms, and bring us with all the saints to feast at your table in heaven. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory be yours, almighty Father, for ever and ever. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We now come to the fraction. The bread is broken. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Next, the Agnus Dei. Latin for Lamb of God is sung.
Draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. We praise and thank you, O Christ, for this sacred feast. For here we receive you. Here the memory of your passion is renewed. Here our minds are filled with grace. And here a pledge of future glory is given when we shall feast at that table where you reign with all your saints forever. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Do please be seated. Um, thank you so much for your patience, because actually what you thought when I said no sermon this morning that you were getting home early, but it's not quite worked out that way, so thank you. Um, please do stay after the service for coffee and bring your questions. Many thanks to all who made our Harvest Quiz Night last night such a success. It was really super. Another big round of applause to John and his team in the kitchen and Alison for all the quiz questions and everything. So thank you. Um, there's lots of new things happening. So there's, uh, I'm going to have to whiz through the notice sheet, just remind you of some of them. Um, Messy Church today is back um, from four to six in the hall, so please do, I know there's so many of you helping, please do invite your friends. Um, there are cards for sale, Christmas cards for sale, Christmas, uh, in the hall, in the hall. Um, this week is the funeral of Audrey Darrington, and I've heard from her family that they would be delighted if you could stay after the service for refreshments. Um, and. There's a drop-in cafe starting this week on Wednesday, which means that the Eucharist is starting on Tuesday. So please come at 10 on, on Tuesday for the Eucharist. This week is the last week you can join our Alpha course, but we are planning to open up the Holy Spirit Day or weekend on the 19th of November to anyone who would like to come along. More details to follow, but do approach me if you'd like to come on that. Now, our cause for celebration this week, due to the sterling efforts from our sadly newly lame Tina Ryan, we have received a grant of £1,000 towards the reopening of our drop-in cafe from ASDA. So thank you very much to ASMA, ASDA and cause for celebration. I think that involves a round of applause for Tina and her team. Thank you. So, um, we now move, um, well, we'll sing our final hymn, and then we move into the dismissal. And in the Latin Mass, the last words were this, ite missa est, which is where that word mass comes from. Um, it just means now go, the mass has ended in effect. So, let's stand to sing our final hymn.
minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.